Hello, I'm your host, Brian Callanan. A new law could help a statewide police hiring crisis by allowing DACA recipients, known as DREAMers, to become law enforcement officers. The SPD is having serious recruitment and retention issues, a problem seen in police departments across the country. Recruiting is a, is a big issue in, in just about every community. To encourage more candidates to become cops, Washington State has just passed a measure allowing immigrants with DACA status to apply for these and other civil service jobs. They want to serve in communities. They want to protect their communities. They want to be out there involved. So it is a win for DACA recipients, but even more, it is a win for our local economy in the city of Seattle. Advocates say these so-called dreamers who came here with their families as children are part of a local immigrant community that already puts billions of dollars into local tax coffers. Immigrants are contributing significantly. With the new law, city officials say, DACA recipients can serve in critical roles, tackling public safety issues that can often involve immigrants and communities of color. And they can talk directly to that community, have the cultural competency to understand what the community needs are. Lawmakers say with more than 14,000 DACA recipients in our state, Senate Bill 6157 has the potential to change the culture of policing in more ways than one. And it's going to change what people see with respect to law enforcement. It's going to be a, a law enforcement agency that will look like the community that they are serving. Can DREAMers help end a nightmare of recruiting for police and other agencies? The question is, are DACA recipients part of the community? And I think there's a general agreement that the fact is they are. People don't feel comfortable uh, approaching an officer to report a crime. We have to be able to figure out ways that, you know, we're able to bridge the, this gap. That's next on City Inside Out. And joining us to discuss this topic a little bit more, we have with us Steve Strand, former King County Sheriff and head of WASPIC, the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. Steve, good to see you again. Good to see you. We also have with us Blanche Barajas. She is a city, city council member from Pasco in central Washington. She's played a big role in this effort to hire on DREAMers as police officers and civil servants. Council member Barajas, thank you very much for making the trip over. Thank you, absolutely. And also we have with us Chief Adrian Diaz of the Seattle Police Department, who I know is very eager to talk about hiring more officers. Chief, good to see you, too. Thank you for having me. Let's jump right into this. And Councilmember Barajas, I know a few other states have this program to hire DACA recipients as law enforcement officers, California, Colorado, Illinois. But it sounds like you really helped get the ball rolling here in Washington State, the idea which became Senate Bill 6157. Where did this idea come from? Why have you been pushing for this? Um, this idea came from actually police officers in the city of Pasco. So it was initiated a by a conversation with some of the officers as they mentor, um, you know, a, 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 around the, the, the city. Mm -hmm. So it was really their involvement in the community, mentoring, um, being part of, you know, the, the community policing that we really tru truly believe in. And I was approached by one of the uh, officers in particular, uh, letting me know his friend had just retired from the Army, Na Army National Guard. Okay. Um, he intended, intended to become a police officer. He went through all the steps. He applied. He scored really well. Um, but in the background check, it came back that he was not eligible due to his status. Mm -hmm. And so that started the conversation. And who do I need to talk to? to get uh, a certain phrasing or, or a sentence in that RCW to change. Yeah, the state allow, law there, yeah. Correct, mm -hmm. To allow for DACA recipients to, to participate. Mm -hmm. um, in the research that I started, um, it was currently two states that were allowing yeah. DACA to, to be police officers. And then in the years, as I did all this research and talking to people to make the connection, mm -hmm. um, it gradually grew. And up until last year, there were seven states that now allow yeah. DACA to, to be police officers. Yeah, and it sounds like you talked to this guy right over Correct. here. Steve, and I, I wanted to talk about this. WASPIC, your group, it's made up of city, county, state, federal, and tribal law enforcement, a lot of different agencies. 
How did you become convinced this proposal to hire DACA recipients was a good idea? Are rank and file officers on board with this? What can you tell us? It's a great question. And Councilmember Barajas approached me, asked to have coffee with me, and, mm -hmm. and really all this uh, in many ways started from that meeting for coffee where mm -hmm. she presented this idea, what, you know, in terms of what she just said, in terms of feedback from her community. And it reminded me, you know, going back to when I went through the police academy, and they talked about Sir Robert Peel, who is sort of the father mm -hmm. of modern policing from the London Metropolitan Police. And they say, uh, Robert Peel said, the police are the people and people are the police. It speaks to the fact that the police are not a force that comes in to occupy, but rather they're of the community. And that's another way of saying, you know, this topic that we're talking about is about how do we better serve the community and include people who are a part of the community. The question is, are DACA recipients part of the community? And I think there's a general agreement that the fact is they are. Yeah. So how do we fix this uh, almost another unintended consequence of the limbo that's mm -hmm. that so many live that in. legal limbo, yeah. In terms of immigration. Mm -hmm. And so the conversation we had, uh, the council member and I, I, I said, well, we need to build stakeholder support. I asked her to speak to some of her local elected officials, including the sheriff of Franklin County, where Pasco is located. She came back and she said, I've spoken to them. We have strong support, bipartisan. Mm -hmm. Let's move forward. And frankly, it's been a great bill to work on. It's been bipartisan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been a few questions here yeah, and there, which but we'll bring up. Yeah. Those. Mm -hmm. um, but we've worked it through. It's going to be signed, I think, by the governor next week. Yeah. And it's a great example of building stakeholder participation as a way to support our community. And most importantly, I think, um, expand the pool, not water down the pool, but expand the pool for recruiting law enforcement officers. That's a huge need for us. right? It now. is. It is. And we'll definitely dive into that, too. Uh, Chief Diaz, maybe we can start bringing up this idea. It was reported a few weeks ago. The SPD is dealing with the lowest amount of sworn officers you've had since the 1990s. Recruiting and retaining officers have been very difficult. I know you know that well. Yes. How do you foresee a tool like Senate Bill 6157? How is that going to help with officer hiring, officer recruiting? Some thoughts about this. Yeah, it opens up the uh, the pool of applicants. Uh, honestly, we have members of the community. Uh, we're one of the largest, you know, populations in the state or out of the in the country. That in terms have, of DACA recipients, yeah. In terms of DACA recipients, and this is really important that we actually have members of our community that serve, some speak the language, understand the community, uh, you know, have gone to the schools in the in the in the city, um, and this is this is really just a great opportunity for us to really bridge out our community policing and our relational policing uh, philosophy. Yeah, I, I'm very much looking forward to seeing how this would work. So let's get into how it would work. And Steve, maybe I can start with you here. As I understand this, as this goes through, this program would have applicants with DACA status. They'd be getting more preference points when they apply for these civil service jobs. Can you break down some of the details yeah. here? So let me be clear. And, and so they don't receive preference points okay. per se, but it, what it does change, the law, the state law, 6157, changes the it allows for DACA recipients to apply for and to be hired okay. as law enforcement officers, okay. which presently is not in, in law. It is right, not right. allowed. Mm -hmm. So it changes that. And then it also uh, works to resolve the issues with the possession of a firearm. Yes. Um, there's federal prohibitions for people who are not uh, either legal, lawful, permanent residents mm -hmm. or citizens. And so it, it works to resolve that issue. In addition, the bill goes beyond that to provide additional preference points for certain things such as a college degree, um, experience with something like AmeriCorps or mm. some of those really valuable yeah. uh, past experiences. Peace Corps type and stuff. Then and yeah. bilingualism, mm -hmm. which may include DACA recipients. It's one of the many reasons it's important for us to have that hiring pool available to us. Yeah. But it's two separate things, both of which I think are going to serve law enforcement well to expand that qualified uh, applicant pool. Yeah. That's why it's one of the reasons it's such a good bill and such a yeah. positive bill. Let, let's talk about that expansion. Chief Diaz, maybe I can jump back to you. I talked a little bit with Seattle's Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. They say our state may have as many as 18,000 DACA recipients, with a third to half of them in Seattle and King County. So I'm talking about six to 9,000 people potentially for you to consider. I guess I'm just trying to figure out how do you envision making this DACA hiring effort part of your overall recruiting and hiring efforts here in Seattle? Yeah, our, right now our team is actually putting together very specific messaging with the radio, uh, with anything, uh, with our Spanish media. Many, you know, we lost Univision uh, as a community. Yeah. However, there's many of them are actually going into uh, social media type of... Uh, oh, yeah. uh, um,
media news information. So we want to hit those uh, um, uh, outlets mm -hmm. to be able to really drive home that we're we're hiring, mm -hmm. um, and also work with the schools. Now I'm talking not just the you know you're not talking about high school, but you know so right now in the in this city we have the ability to uh, have people or have students that are now going to community colleges mm -hmm. uh, as part of the, um, that next year's uh, um, uh, program that we have. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but this actually opens up the applicant. Yeah. Okay, what job are you looking for? Yeah. You might have been going to engineering. You might have gone to psychology. You might have gone to a variety of different other fields. Yeah. Seattle Promise Program. Yeah. The Seattle Promise. Exactly, yeah. But why don't you think about the police department? Mm. You don't want to sit behind a desk. We actually <laughs> allow you to actually be out in, in the fresh air, interacting, serving your community, helping others, and this is the job to do it. Yeah, I, I'm interested to see how that plays out. And maybe Council Member Barajas, I can go back to you here because it's definitely going to take more than news releases and radio ads and all that. I'm thinking about outreach into different communities in different okay. cities. How do you set that up to make it successful? What would that look like in Pasco, for example? So Chief Adrian mentioned a little bit about the outreach into schools. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our officers are highly involved in schools and presentations and job fairs. Um, and so taking advantage of those interactions, taking the advantage of maybe a, a national night out where you're interacting with kids as young as 10 years old mm -hmm. and, and kids that are saying, oh, I, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. And, you know, uh, plant that seed to where they desire, and as they're growing and learning and seeing an officer in their neighborhood, and it's, it's normal, a yeah. friendly person. Who looks person, like them, yeah. Right, a friendly person that they can ad identify with. Yeah. You know, take advantage of that opportunity and, and just keep growing that relationship, mm -hmm. that partnership with the parents, with the schools, you mentioned it, with colleges, alternative uh, education, yep. all of that. Yeah. Uh, Chief, can I jump back to you on this? Because I think there's a bigger issue here of building trust with the police department. I know you talk about that a lot in, in general, but building that trust with our immigrant communities. I think that can be an issue sometimes. Sometimes immigrants in those communities do not trust the police. Maybe they ran away from the police in their home countries just to come to the U.S. Can you talk about that? Because I think that's that can be a challenging issue for law enforcement. Yeah, I mean, back in 2001, the city actually passed, you know, a, a, a bill that would allow us or as an ordinance to not ask for immigration status. Mm -hmm. So we've really tried to push that home that we want to work with the community. We want to build those relationships. This is the next iteration. Now we can actually higher uh, from our community mm -hmm. uh, people kids that are literally have have grown up here since you know I've, I've seen as young as one or two years old that now are 20 21 years old that are now potential applicants uh, to the police department mm -hmm. they wouldn't even know what Mexico looked like yeah mm -hmm. and now they're like this is my opportunity to actually be able to provide for my family yeah and not just a job but a, a civil service job that allows you to uh, have a pension and allows you to have you know, other opportunities that you might not have. And so I think for us, it's really making sure that the families in our, in our, our communities know that this is a huge opportunity yeah. to communities that might not have had those other things when we talk about pension and oh, medical yeah. and all these other different... Any sort of work opportunities. Any sort of right? work opportunities. Yeah. But really, I think, you know, when you look at civil service and we look at, at policing and ability able to serve your community, yeah. we know, at least from when I grew up, we had a lot of uh, Latinos join the military because that was their path to citizenship. Okay. It was their path to being able to have other job opportunities. And this should be that also that same path. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and You've been talking about this on the national level, it sounds uh, exactly. like. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and so at the national level, I've been really pushing that, that, you know, after so many years, you should have that path to citizenship. Military right. has, been, has done it for so many years. In fact, every single July 4th, I go down to the citizenship uh, swearing-in ceremony down at uh, Seattle Center. Right. You have four or 500 people that are going in. Many of them are military yeah. because they're serving their country, and then they have that path to citizenship. Yeah. This is that opportunity. Thank you. And, Chief, I want to stick with you because I want to talk about some of the larger challenges involved with police hiring. City Council, I know, has been recently pushing you to speed up the process, get officers hired more quickly. You know this, I know this too. As positive as this DACA program I know could be, I want to talk about some of the pragmatic details, and I'm definitely yeah. pulling open a can of worms here. Are you concerned that having this new hiring process for DACA recipients could put another layer of bureaucracy and slow things down. I just wanted to make sure I brought that up. Actually, no. Many of the, many of DACA recipients have been here for, for years, decades. And it, for us, it's about the ability to do, 
do a background check. You know, typically we look at 10 years uh, of work history. Yeah. Um, many of the many of the people that are 21, 22 were in school, and and they have very little you know work history, but they have the heart and soul to really try to make sure that they serve their community, mm -hmm. and so that's what we're doing our background check. We're trying to make sure that we've done all, you know, our due diligence, uh, but there's also a process just to become a DACA recipient. There's mm -hmm. there's a background process. They, so, they've gone through some paperwork <laughs> for sure. So yeah. So, yeah. so it's not that this is like you know we're hiring people that we can't do any information checks on it. They've already done a check, and so yeah. there you. Council member, please. I'll add part of part of the the I wouldn't say research, but part of the conversations that I had as I was looking into what it took to change this. Mm -hmm. The DACA kids are one of the most scrutinized groups of, of people as they have to apply every two years. Mm -hmm. Nothing can be on their record, not even a speeding ticket yeah. can be on their record to be eligible for the next yeah. uh, to get uh, renewed. Yeah, correct? right, right. So I, I I agree with what you're saying, but this pool of people, the, 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 these kids are very well following the law mm -hmm. because they don't want anything to affect any potential uh, uh, pathway to citizenship. That is a great point. There's another legal question I want to tackle with you, Steve. This came up during the process as Senate Bill 6157 was going through hearings. So the federal process does not grant DACA recipients status as legal residents of this country. So generally, federal law would say they should not have guns or ammunition. And this is where I've seen a lot of passionate responses on social media. Take those for what you will. People saying these aren't legal residents. Why are they getting guns? Things like that. This new bill from the state, I think, has some answers to that. Can you break this down, please? It does. And you referred to the fact that this does get, you know, it, it, it's part of the immigration debate, which is very intense <clears throat> and it's sometimes very divisive. It can become very partisan. The issue of DACA recipients is a unique group of individuals, even though there's 14 to 18,000 in our state. There's a lot, but they've been they've been provided with special status through an executive action. Um, they are highly scrutinized, as the council member mentioned. Yeah. It's absolutely true. And many, I mean, they came here as children, generally speaking. That's the status of DACA recipients. Yeah. So to your question, it's this interplay between federal requirements in terms of firearms. A, a non-citizen cannot have a firearm mm -hmm. unless they are a lawful permanent resident, which does not apply to DACA recipients. Mm -hmm. So how do we resolve that? Um, other states uh, worked to resolve that in their, their laws before ours. And this was where we see sort of the, the, the cooperation of the sheriffs and chiefs, Chief Diaz and others come together in some of the things that Chief Diaz does. Uh, there was some question about how do we properly provide the legal uh, way that a person can carry a firearm as a police officer mm -hmm. if they're hired under this law. Yeah. During the time that this was under consideration by the Washington State Legislature, um, Chief Diaz actually sent to us a document that he had received in, through his contacts and his network from the Department of Justice that s specifically clarified um, how that can be done under federal law, existing federal mm -hmm. law. Right. So as long as the agency, if they choose to hire a DACA recipient, um, specifically creates a policy yeah. that says you carry a firearm as part of your job. Okay. That then is allowed under federal law per the Department of Justice. So we've really gotten a lot more clarity than we had before. Yeah. So the, the, the what ifs out there include that if Chief, if Chief Diaz ch uh, chooses to hire DACA recipients and they come on board, mm -hmm. could a future president revoke that executive action? Yeah, I, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, you also have to deal with the background check issues, which again, most, most DACA recipients have lived here for most of their lives. Yeah. So there are some what ifs and there's some risks in there. Yeah. There's some risks to potentially losing people that we've invested in over time. Yeah. And the question is, is the risk worth it? And that is that connection with the community worth it? And I think most chiefs and sheriffs believe it is. Yeah, well, let me keep going down that path. And I, I think this is something, maybe Council Member Barajas, I can bring you in here. So DACA has been around since 2012. September last year, there was a federal federal judge in Texas that ruled twice that DACA was illegal. And so just this point that Steve made, I mean, these DACA recipients didn't lose any protections. They can still renew the current ones, but no new applications are right. being taken here. I guess I just wanted to ask that question. Are you concerned that the for the future of dreamers in our country and the future of this program, could that be, uh, could it all change with the presidential election this November? You know, that's always a risk. And every year, every year when they are applying, reapplying for their status, that's a risk. And everyone is always fearful of what's this president going president to do. Yeah. Um, so what can we do about that? We really can't do anything. It's mm. just keep encouraging kids to continue applying, continue staying on point right. with everything that they're doing. Um, 
Well, and, and j let me let me jump in because I, I I hear what you're saying, and I almost feel like 6157 could be. I mean, it's a very hot topic, of course, immigration in our country, and has been for decades. But is this a type of program that could help bring down the, the temperature on that in terms of our national conversation? Some thoughts about that? I, I think it will. Uh, it'll definitely educate around what DACA is, around the individuals that are DACA recipients. Yeah. You know, again, not asking for handouts. It's just giving breaking down barriers and giving them the opportunity for a, a career that they really want to be involved in. Yeah. Um, and just breaking those those barriers to where they can be involved and give back to the communities that they grew up in. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's part of that. As far as can it change in the future? Definitely. Yeah. It can change. It's, it's a fear that they always have. However, if I'm not mistaken, and you can probably add to this, um, there's, there's uh, um, the last sentence in the, in the bill. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect them moving forward. I see. Okay. I see. Okay. It'll, well, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out uh, legally. And I, did you have, please? Run, I yeah. was just going to say yeah. that th there's a political element to this. Of course there is. And there's a presidential election this fall. Yep. Um, if you look at this, this is about public safety and reaching out to the community with a group of people who have a, a very specific status and have had it for 12 years mm -hmm. through three administrations from two different parties. That's a fact. And if this helps build public safety and provide an avenue for individuals, no matter who the president is, yeah. I think the argument is they're serving our communities. This is something that everyone should recognize. I mean, everyone understands the strong opinions about the border. It's a public safety crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis. Those are all still there. Yeah. But regardless of who the president is, I think that if we can start to come together with these kind of solutions, no matter who that person is, it, it provides a pathway yeah. for individuals who are trying to live their lives. Yeah and serve their community. Chief, did you have a thought? Yeah, we have, we've had non-citizens serve our country in the military for since the test of time. And so, you know, they've actually been able to carry uh, firearms, they've been able to serve in wars, and, um, and so the police department is no different. You know, the, the whole firearm issue, we've already done it for the military. What we're really trying to focus on is actually potentially creating national legislation because more states are jumping on board. And it is an, it is not a bipartisan divide on this. Many of the states, Virginia was just this last one, that the, now the bill is on the governor's desk, that literally are now trying to, to move forward on this. And I think what for me is really important that it doesn't become a presidential, you know, uh, conflict that whoever becomes the president then says, you know, I'm not going to get rid of it. If we can actually put it in national legislation, yeah. help out all of our communities that are across the country mm -hmm. that need people to serve and honorably serve our, our departments yeah. and serve our communities, and then also create a path to citizenship. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a, a good way for starting that comprehensive immigration discussion. Yeah. But for us, for our community's sakes, that literally police departments are short-staffed, yeah. this is that opportunity for us to be able to, to really engage. We've done it for the military. Yeah. For the police departments, this is that next step. Steve. And then just to be clear, um, this had bipartisan authorship, sponsorship in the Senate, included uh, Senator Torres from, mm -hmm. uh, from Tri-Cities, who's a Republican, and had Democrats uh, sponsors as well. And it passed overwhelmingly in yeah. both the House and the Senate with bipartisan votes. Okay. So this is not about partisan politics. Yeah. This is about how do we come together. Yes. Fair. Uh, Chief, I wanted to jump back to you because, unfortunately, over the past couple of months, we have seen a few different immigrant families, first generation, mm -hmm. second generation, be affected by gun violence mm -hmm. in, our, in our region. I'm thinking specifically back to the case of Muhammad Adam. I'm from the West Seattle yeah. area. It happened there. The 15-year-old boy of East African heritage shot and killed in West Seattle back in January. I just have another big picture question here. Do you think a program like this, hiring dreamers as officers, hopefully making an impact on public safety, could help out these sometimes very vulnerable immigrant families? It's essential. I mean, you know, we, we put in people that have had formerly incarcerated to help out reduce gun violence because it, they can talk with youth that are, you know, experiencing yeah. troubled uh, times. But having, you know, people from our community that speak languages, understand the culture, that is also the next step of, of us of really integrating into our communities yeah. in a different way. And yeah. so, yes, this is, I'm talking about East Africans, I'm talking about, you know, Latinos, Latinas, like, we have to be able to figure out ways that, you know, we're able to bridge the, this gap. Yeah. And uh, and I think this is that this is that path, at least for the dreamers to start with. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, I wanted to make sure I brought this up. Senator John Lovick, uh, the prime sponsor for Senate Bill 6157, a longtime law enforcement officer himself, told me he saw this bill as a way to to change the culture of policing. I know you've heard that term many times in your years. Is this the kind of measure that can actually make that happen? 
Well, it's one of many things that I think we're all doing together in terms of making more, making stronger the culture of policing and its relationship with the community. As the chief is talking about these relationships with the community, I was a longtime chief and sheriff myself before yep. I came to this position. And I remember as a chief, I was invited by an immigrants group to come in and speak with persons who are undocumented mm -hmm. to make very clear in uniform as the chief that we were not going to ask about status, that we wanted to know if they were victims of crime and to serve them. Yeah. And I remember walking into that room, even though they'd been told I was coming, and feeling the anxiety and feeling the tension and the, the you know, just how, frankly, scared mm -hmm. so many were. And it helped me to sort of get into that place. And then once we started talking and, and interacting and communicating, it was amazing the change that you could see, including with us and with yeah. our officers. Yeah, I was going to say. This is all part of that. Yeah. And it, it, again, it's not about politics. It's about how do we better serve our community. And if yeah. a person is victimized, yeah. how do they feel comfortable and trusting of their law enforcement agency? Okay. This is one of many things that we can and should do. Council member. And, and I'll add to what you're saying, Director. Um, that's the primary reason why I was involved, not only because an officer brought the situation to me to, to explain mm -hmm. about someone who wanted to apply, but really, as we're in the community, especially in the Tri-Cities, a predominantly Latino, uh, a very diverse community, but predominantly Latino community, you go back to that. People don't feel comfortable uh, approaching an officer to report a crime, to report that they're, they're being victims. So how can you get to that? You're talking about bridging gaps, breaking down barriers. This is this is it. This is a way putting one of their own within their community that they know, a, a face that they recognize mm -hmm. and, and feel comfortable and come in and report that. Yeah, thank you. We need to wrap up here. And uh, Councilmember Barajas, maybe I can start with you. When are we going to see a DACA recipient as an officer in the state of Washington? What's that going to mean to you? I need the 30-second version if you can. Give me a date when you're going to sign the bill, and I will make <laughs> sure I have a line. Uh, it's not me. It's going to be the apply. governor, but yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> but as soon as possible. Okay, all right. Uh, Chief, maybe uh, talking about this a little more. You've been advocating this, I know, on a, a national level, board president of the Police Executive Research Forum, which talks about this a lot on the U.S. level here. What do you envision in terms of seeing DACA recipients move through the pipeline? What's that going to mean for our city and our country? I think it creates more diversity in our department, uh, but nationally it actually allows us to integrate more into our communities and build that trust. And I think nationally it allows us to, but if we could push national legislation and create a path to citizenship, it really actually integrates uh, all of our communities back into as one community. All right. Thank you very much for that. Steve, some final thoughts on when you see this program rolling out and what overall impact you're hoping it has. Well, I do expect it to be signed next week by the yep. governor. I um, want to thank Councilmember Barajas for getting this started. We're 51st in the nation in staffing, <clears throat> last in the nation. That needs to change. We need to increase staffing. There's political agreement on that in our state in terms of increasing law enforcement staffing. This, I think, will be part of it. And the last thing I'll say is, if you're watching this and you are a DACA recipient, if you know a DACA recipient, be aware of this. And what do you do if they're interested in public service, firefighting, law enforcement? Mm -hmm. um, call your local law enforcement agency. Most are hiring. Yeah. And we need you. Okay. Thank you all for this. And we will be right back. What are people saying on social media about the plan to allow DACA recipients to become police officers? One person writes, good idea. I teach these kids. Hardworking, smart, didn't do anything wrong. Parents brought them here. I would love to have them as police officers. Another person comments, so in short, illegal immigrants will soon be able to be police officers. We're reaching new levels of crazy. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on social media. Thank you for that input. Thank you for your input as well. And we will see you next time on City Inside Out.